Okay, well, hello everyone and welcome. Thank you all for your interest in my JALT presentation today. Um, I have to say I, I'm very sad that we're not doing this face-to-face. -face. I was really looking forward to a trip to Japan this year, but oh well, COVID-19 is what it is and we're doing the best that we can. So again, thank you all for your interest. Um, as it says here on the screen, my name is Andy Halverson, and I work at One Joe Kane University. So a little bit of information about that on the next slide. So I'm currently an associate professor of education at One Joe Kane University in One Joe, China, where I am the coordinator of their MAT cell program. And I have been working in the field of English language teaching and teacher training for a little bit over 20 years now. And I have experience working and teaching in China, obviously, where I work now. But I've also lived and worked in Japan as well. I taught for a couple of years at a university in Nagoya. So I have some familiarity with the Japanese context as well. And I've done some work with the U.S. State Department with the US federal government as an English language fellow also. So I have some background in the field and today I'm going to be talking about online discussions, something that we've all been engaged with quite a bit lately under coronavirus, I think. And I've been collecting some data from students, from undergraduate students and graduate students about their own perceptions of online discussions, how they feel about them how they like or don't like to engage in that format. So I'm just gonna share a little bit of that data with you today and maybe talk about some tips as well that you can use to improve the quality of your online discussions. Okay, so a quick agenda for our session. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little overview of my data collection and analysis thus far. And then I'll present some of that data, the student perceptions of online discussions. And then, like I said, at the end, I've got three or four slides that are kind of putting together those student perceptions of online discussions into tips that you might be able to use for your own classes. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so in terms of data collection, uh, this is primarily qualitative work. Um, I started out with survey data collected from both undergraduate, that's UG on my slides, and graduate, that's G on my slides. So I had 28 undergraduate participants and 14 graduate student participants. These were students in my classes and in a couple of other classes at the university I was previously teaching at in the United States. So again, uh, 28 undergraduate students and 14 graduate students participated and I collected survey data from all of those students initially. Uh, as a follow-up to the surveys, after I had spent some time analyzing that data and looking at some themes within the survey data, I did follow up face-to-face -face interviews with three of the undergraduate students and three of the graduate students as well. And it's really that interview data that I'm gonna talk about today. I've pulled in a couple of highlights from the surveys as well, but primarily what I'm showing you today is interview data around my work with those three undergraduate and three graduate students. So, I wanna give you just uh, some background for the context for both of these student groups, because as you know, with qualitative data, context really matters. So I just wanna make clear who these students are. Uh, undergraduate students that I was working with, these were three advanced level um, non-native speakers of English studying in a TESOL methods course. And at this time, because of the early onset of coronavirus, we had moved fully online. So this is a TESOL methods course for undergraduate students that was fully online. Um, Non-native speakers, as I said, uh, two of them were Chinese and one of them was Korean. And they were studying, again, in the United States at the university where I previously worked and taking teacher training courses. And for the most part, the undergraduates had very limited online learning experience prior to COVID. 
uh, in China and in Korea, they had had very little experience with online courses. At the university in the United States, they'd had some exposure to Blackboard and Canvas, but limited. So the undergraduates had quite little experience with online education and online discussions. The graduate students, again, three advanced level non-native speakers studying in a TESOL methods course, fully online. These are Japanese and Chinese background students. And uh, within this group of graduate students, there was a little bit more experience with online learning and teaching also, because the graduate students, many of them had backgrounds in teaching and had run, one of them at least had run a course online previously. So she had fairly good experience with online learning and online discussion forms. Okay, so that's just a little context, who these students are, what they know and what they don't know going into the research. And like I said, context is important because if you're reviewing this kind of research, you want to make determinations about your own context and whether the work that I've done matches with your own similar context or not. Okay, uh, so just a minute. Think about this for a second. Probably all of you have had some experience experience at this point with the use of online discussions, either as a teacher or as a learner, how has it gone? What kind of challenges have you faced? What kind of positive experiences have you had? What kind of negative experiences? How has that gone up until now? And again, I wish we were, I wish we were all face to face so we could have an actual discussion about this, but that's okay. Think to yourself, and then I will move forward. Okay. So from the students, um, again, I, like I said, these are both undergraduate and graduate students. And I tried to pull out themes primarily from the interview data, but a little bit of theme work comes from the surveys as well. And I tried to pull out themes that were consistent across the undergraduate and graduate populations. And that actually wasn't that hard to do in this case. So I have five themes here up on the screen and I'm gonna show you some data and some highlights for each of these. But just to run through the themes as I saw them from the data. Uh, the first one really has to do with student autonomy and students asking for um, greater flexibility and greater autonomy within the online discussions that they were participating in. And, you know, completely makes sense, of course. Um, the second theme has to do with moving beyond discussions. And this really is that idea that discussion format can be kind of limiting online. And there's a lot of other options that we can do that are similar to discussions that might push the students in somewhat different directions. And students had some creative ideas about that as well. And uh, two and three are kind of similar because three is really about other forms of engagement with peers. And students were talking about how they could possibly get together outside of class or get together on social media, other modalities for engaging with each other because they felt somewhat trapped, somewhat limited by the fully online experience. Another point has to do with transparency of assessment, and I'll talk about this in more detail, but it came up repeatedly, both for students in my classes and students in other classes as well, is this idea that the instructor of the courses was not providing them with enough clear information about what was required, you know, how long their discussion post had to be, when they had to be posted, who they had to respond to, who they didn't have to respond to. So they felt some lack of transparency there, and that was kind of frustrating. And again, totally understandable. One of the basic uh, premises of assessment is this idea of transparency. And if we're not being transparent with our students, we're probably doing something wrong, but there's a lot of things to think about around online learning and online discussion. Uh, finally, more personalization. And again, students had some interesting ideas and thoughts here about how to make the discussions a little bit less academic all the time about the book, about the material, and a little bit more personal. <clears throat> so let me show you a few highlights, quotes mostly from data around these themes. So the first one, as I said, has to do with autonomy. And there's a couple different forms of autonomy addressed here in these comments. 
Uh, in number one, the student says, it sometimes feels like doing it just because we have to. Some choices about what to answer would help based on our interests. So my reading of this, and again, this is a face-to-face -face discussion I had, well, an online discussion I had with students when I was collecting data. But the, the point here was really that they, the student was asking for, you know, do I have to only answer the questions that you ask? Could I have some more choice in the discussions? Could we possibly have some flexibility about what questions we answer or what items we complete based on our own interests? And autonomy-wise, that completely makes sense to me. Um, number two is autonomy in terms of choice or flexibility around partner selection. And initially with my own online teaching, I was, you know, wanting to be a little bit more in control of the process and giving students partners and putting students into groups and controlling things that way. Um, but students have suggested to me that they really kind of prefer to have some flexibility around the selection of who they're working with. And that completely makes sense. And I'll talk some more about how I organize discussion sections into groups a little bit. Um, autonomy and flexibility around deadlines and scheduling. The third point says the deadlines are fixed, but couldn't we have more choice depending on our schedules? Students found when they shifted to fully online courses, they were kind of overwhelmed and having trouble with time management issues. So they were asking for this idea of you know, if I need to complete this class on Wednesday, but my next online class is happening on Wednesday at the same time, how am I gonna manage my deadline and my participation in the other course? So they were just asking for flexibility and autonomy and choice around deadlines. Again, completely makes sense to me, but not something I would think about without listening carefully to my students. Uh, moving beyond discussions, why don't we do the assignment in the discussion and talk about that? Um, this is something I have moved towards in my own online discussion. The idea that they can do some exercise in your textbook or participate in some kind of activity or assignment that you have for them and then share that in the discussion and discuss about that. So it's the integration of the assignment work with the discussion section, which I had not been doing in the past, which I, like I said, do find myself doing more. Uh, and uh, this point number two, the structure each week is the same for discussions. Could we do something else? Just being a little bit bored by the format each week. There's only one quote here, but in terms of other forms of peer engagement, I thought this was interesting. Um, it's not an uncommon comment to have something like the first sentence here, right? I feel like I miss my classmates. Of course, when we all shifted fully online, people were isolated and frustrated. But just online discussion doesn't get us to talk. I think we should add to online discussions with face-to-face -face discussions on WhatsApp or something, some way that feels normal to students. Just being in Canvas and writing is not as fun. Students were just asking for social engagement in some kind of face-to-face, -face. you know, this is virtual face-to-face, -face, of course, but maybe through your computer on some platform for social media like WhatsApp, for example, just something that's a little bit more relevant to their own experience. And then this point about assessment and transparency I mentioned earlier. Uh, first quote, in your class it is clear, but in other classes I don't know how much to write or what to say exactly. And uh, I only included one quote here, but I heard this from almost all of my participants. They were frustrated because they felt like there was a lack of direction or clarity about where they needed to go and what they needed to do with their online discussion performance. So I think it's important, and I'll share some examples of this, to provide examples of clarity and transparency to your students. Uh, number two is about models or samples, and number three is also about samples. And then we have this point about personalization. Um, number one, another teacher was fun when we talked about an item from our kitchen that we like. So this was a point a student was making in the interview uh, in another class. A teacher just kind of asked them to walk into their kitchen and find a tool that they use a lot in the kitchen, bring it back to Zoom and let's talk about that thing. Why is it valuable for you? It was just this simple idea that they, they were making the learning a little bit more personal, personalizing the experience. 
Number two, I think discussions could be better if we talked more about our lives and not just about the working class. Maybe each week we could have an academic discussion and then one personal discussion too, or something like that. Again, with COVID, people isolated at home, they want to have that personal connection and this makes sense to me, absolutely. So um, those are some of the themes in the data. And I just wanna talk for a couple of minutes about how to maybe translate some of those themes into tips for managing online discussions. And that's not too hard to do, I don't think. So tip number one has to do with deadlines and assignments. And my recommendation is to have some assignments do um, discussion forum requirement assignments do at the midweek and then again at the end of the week. And that gives students some choice and some flexibility. It also spreads out your grading a little bit as a teacher, and you know that's a positive thing. Avoid procrastination by learners and allows for more formative feedback from peers and instructors. But you don't need to very rigidly say, you must post on Wednesday, you must post on Friday. Give them a window, give them three or four days to do the post by, another three or four days to write their responses by. But give them flexibility in there and I think students will appreciate that. Uh, groups and leaders, online discussions do not have to be with the entire class. They can be divided up into groups of three to six people. I like working with four, but I often in my on, on my online platform, be it Canvas or Blackboard or whatever it is, I divide the discussions into smaller groups. So this, the group discussion as a class of 20 or 25 or whatever becomes a small group discussion of four, five, six individuals. And students respond very positively to that. It shouldn't be only that. You can balance that easily with whole class discussions as well, in my opinion. Um, group leaders, discussion leaders can be a way to shake up the discussions a little bit, just give some variety to the discussion and give a little bit more responsibility to students as well. Assessment transparency, um, a couple things are really important in online discussions. One is to tell them specifically how their points are allocated. And I, I have a sample here, you certainly don't need to use this exactly, you can use anything that's appropriate for your own context, but the idea is that you tell them, well, what does a one point post look like? What does a three point post look like? What does a five point post look like? This is transparency, right? It's being clear to your students about what your expectations are for them. Um, and then I give samples now. Whenever I teach a class that has an online component and there are discussion sections involved, I provide a sample. Here's a sample of what a three point post looks like. Here's a sample of what a five point post looks like. And I don't find that problematic. Students aren't copying the samples. Exactly, they're just looking to the samples to get an idea of what's expected. So again, this just comes down to transparency in assessment. Uh, tip four, other task types. So move beyond simple questions to more complex tasks that require some critical thinking in your online discussion. So what could this look like? Uh, categorization activities, ranking activities, sequencing activities, fill in the chart activities. I've got a few examples here I'll show you real quickly. And they're kind of small, you can't read them very clearly, but that's not the point. The point is just to see how I've organized things in the past. So here, um, filling in a chart. You can, add, you can post a chart in Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle or whatever format you're using and ask students within the discussion to fill in different components and then have discussions about how they've chosen to fill these things in. Right, that's an engaging discussion about how they've done their assignment. And this is back to that idea of integration of the assignment and the online discussion. Uh, sequencing tasks, give them a list, have them sequence them, talk about how they've chosen to sequence and why. Categorization tasks, give them a group, give them a collection of things and have them put them into categories. You've probably done something like that in the classroom as well but there's no reason they can't do that in an online discussion, okay? So there's just some general tips, I think, overall. Vary deadlines to give autonomy, choose groups carefully, find leaders for your groups, have assessment transparency, 
and vary your task types as much as possible. And my last point right there at the bottom, do not be afraid to listen to your students and make changes, right? My, I, I became a much better, I believe, instructor online after listening to my students, collecting some data, and then going back and making adjustments, you know, because of what they told me. And students are, you know, very happy to see the teachers make changes, positive changes to a course based on their feedback. I think that's valuable and it shows, you know, empathy from the teacher to the student. And that's important. Okay, that's just about 20 minutes. I'm trying to leave a little bit of time at the end for discussion, but of course we're not face-to-face. -face. When this happens on November 23rd, I believe, I will be available for live Q&A afterwards. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you go back and review the video and see the parts that you missed if there is anything you wanna review. And please, I encourage you to share this with others as well. So thank you all so much and I appreciate your time.